The fact that you have hope in your heart is the imprint of the image of God. And it is speaking to you. But you fight it because your society has brainwashed you into thinking something different. The reason why they speculate the multiverse is because without the speculation of the multiverse, the universe looks designed. And the reality is that that narrative that closely fits reality is the truth. So you found the truth. You just have to have the courage to grasp it with both hands for yourself. Why Why has he put me on this earth Great to, to, do this, to do this test? And if I fail, he's going to throw me into the everlasting darkness and just turn his back on me. Why, why would he do that? In the sense, in the sense, in the sense that, in the sense that he turned again, he, he called us to go against our natural nature. Yes, but his revolution was on a much grander scale than just politics or just economics. He's calling you to change your very nature as a human. He's calling you to be a different kind of human being. So it's revolutionary in the sense that it affects the whole of humanity yes. and their mindset. Yes, it's revolutionary in the sense that he's calling us to change the way we understand being human and one that simply doesn't follow what our desires and our wants and our lusts are, but reorientates ourselves towards God. And in that sense, it's revolutionary. So when you just said, I want you to be revolutionary, what, 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 I'm not, I'm not, it's not a gotcha question, I'm asking. No, it's all right. What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> well, I gave an example which is this idea of, of Christians banding together in close, tight-knit communities. Our society says live as an individual, be an individual consumer. Christianity says don't live as an individual, don't be an individual consumer, but live in a, a, a community of the covenant. And that was how the early Christians lived. Yes, that is how the early Christians lived. And it did continue when the whole of society became Christian. That, that, that sense of koinonia continued, but it reorganised itself in villages well, around the idea of the monastic tradition. So villagers built up around the monastics. The monastics went into a field. They lived the monastic community in isolation, and then people started coming and living with them. And so you see this tradition within the church of there is those that live in commune within the monasteries, and then those that attach themselves to those monasteries and live with them, but aren't in the commune. And you've got other examples of that by like what would, um, just to think of some examples, like um, the Antioch community in Acton or the Jesus Army, which was a national organization where Christians lived together with a common purse. And then other people attached themselves to that community even if they weren't part of the common. A bit like a kibbutz. Yes. Which shows that which shows that this 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 new covenant tradition has roots in the old covenant. And so you're seeking to go back to that. It's never gone away. It's always been there. It never disappeared. But it's something that because of Western society we've fallen out of. And we need to get back into it. We need to recover it because Christians constantly say to one another that we should live differently to wider culture. But they never think through logically what that looks like. And I'm saying that living in tight-knit communities where we coalesce into a geographical space and we live in a tight-knit community where we meet one another's needs is a way of living differently to the society around us and it will shine like stars in the night to the world around us that you can do things differently. Another example of that would be the Bruderhof and the Amish. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I mean also in the 19th century in industrial areas like County Durham, you know, or, or Wales, coal mines in Wales. Yeah. The thing is, is that the chapel was the centre, like the hub yes. of the local community. Everybody yes. worked down the mine and the, 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 the community, the church, the chapel provided for everybody sort of invested in the, in the chapel and everybody looked after each other. In, in the, just the way, and so the cooperative movement was like incredibly useful and that was very good for everybody, for the, common, for the yeah. common good of everybody. But it's got to be elective socialism, it can't be state imposed. Oh, no, it was voluntary. Yeah, I believe in voluntary elective socialism. 
but it's got but but for these kinds of things to work people have to be bound together by common values and common beliefs and, and this is why this is why th that's the only way you can make it work that's why that's the non-conformist yeah, that's why communism failed on the grand scale because it imposed uh, commonality from above where the only way that it can work is when it comes from the bottom from below where from below they, they, the state should work on capitalist lines well ideally we'd, we'd get away even from capitalism but that's the best model of economy we have right now but it should be supportive of elective communism of ele but, but within the Christian tradition we say that the purpose is not for elective communism the elective communism emerges out of the fact that as a Christian, I start to see myself as belonging to you and you start to see yourself as belonging to me. So suddenly you don't think of this phone as yours and I don't think of my bag as mine. And so you say, well, I can't, can I use your bag? And I go, yeah, sure, because it's yours, because we're part of one body. And so it's that, that sense of the identity that we share that gives birth to the elective communism, socialism that I'm talking about. What about somebody that lives in, in London and they, they, they have to do two or three jobs, they're working all hours, they are probably absolutely tired, exhausted most of the time. That's why they need how a can commune. You make it, how, how, how so? Because if you're working two or three hours, two, if you're two or three jobs, yeah. it's because you're struggling to spun to yourself. Yes. If you lived in a commune, a shared house, yeah? It's not just your burden to pay for the house. You might share that house with 15 other people or 12 other people. And so you don't have to slave yourself out to pay your one rent because you've got 15 other people also earning that are all contributing to the maintenance of the house. So you can work one job rather than three. And so you have more time to do other things. Christians live that reality. Really? I, I've never heard it. I've, I've, I've never heard it. Yeah, Christians that go and look up. Go and look up the Bruderhof. Go and look up the Amish. Go and look up the Antioch community. Go and look up the Jesus Army. I mean, it's di disbanded now, but it was a thing. Go and look up these communes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. And go and see how they live. It's an alternative to how society tells us to live. Because as Christians, we believe that the church is here to create the ultimate revolution. Your nature says to you, I am an island. Your nature says to you, I don't want to be ruled or governed by others. But the reality is the real revolution that we need is one in which we start to see ourselves being connected to other brothers and sisters in Christ and that we transform the way that we live. We don't need capitalism. The Amish have survived quite well without it. Yeah, and they're not a shrinking community, they have lots of kids, they live on the land, they live simply, and that's what we need. We need no, a simple I mean, life. I, I mean, I've actually seen the kibbutz in, and, and, and they, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful, but they, they, they're, all, they're all disappearing now, which is a terrible shame. Yeah. It's a terrible shame. They, they were wonderful in the, in the because, 1970s. Because the vision, I mean, it's difficult to live in a commune. You shouldn't think that it's an easy answer. Living in a commune is difficult. It's really difficult because you're living with the same people. And I'm greedy and I'm selfish and I don't like you using my family. You know, we're the best will in the world. And, that, and that's the Jesus And that's the Jesus revolution. I don't want you wearing my coat. And that's the Jesus revolution because he's calling you out of all of that. Now tell me, does that sound like a good thing? Yeah, yes it does. If it works, if it works. It, well, we've done it for 2,000 years, so we're pretty sure it works. We were doing it both before communism, before capitalism and after capitalism. It does work. The point is, you need to commit yourself to Jesus as his disciple. That's what you need to do. The question is, are you willing? <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm an agnostic, so I mean... Well, I'm saying get off the shelf. Get, get off the fence. Commit yourself. If you can see truth and beauty and goodness and, and nobility in Christ's teaching and in the way that he calls us to be human, stop fighting it. Perfect. <laughs> I see all of those things in I see all of those things in a number of people that are Christians here. I see I see them living trying to live what they preach. Good good people. I'm afraid it just doesn't 
It just doesn't square for me. I wish it did. I wish it did. I'm, I'm being honest with you, but I, I don't believe that there is a God. I just, I, I wish I could. I, I wish I could. Yeah, but, but the, uh, with what, respect, I'm not fine. What I would say to you is that is that we are all induced by our culture to see the world in a certain way. And I am saying to you that you have been spun alive by a society that is guided by the teachings of the enlightenment, by the philosophies of people like David Hume, this idea of skepticism. Okay? Incidentally, skepticism that would go against empiricism and lots of, you know, there's a cognitive dissonance in the way that we think about it. What, I, what I'm saying to you is that truth, truth is, is something that you can find in more than simple um, uh, uh, experimental verification. Now, you know in your heart, when you look within yourself, that the ideas that I'm talking about are noble and good. You also know in your heart that it is not in our nature to live by those ideals. Now, this is the Christian narrative. This is exactly what we Christians say is the reality. That our, that our, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak, as Paul said. That we are, we are torn between that image of God within us that leads us in a direction but our human nature which is fallen and consistently pulls us away from this direction so our narrative as Christians fits reality and the reality is that that narrative that closely fits reality is the truth so you found the truth you just have to have the courage to grasp it with both hands for yourself and I'm challenging you to do so. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Have the courage to change. <laughs> Have the courage to change. It's an easy step. Listen, I respect you greatly. You're a more intelligent man than I am. I honestly believe that you're a more intelligent man than I am. But I, I just do, in the, in the bowels of my gut, I, I just don't buy it, I just don't, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I don't mean to challenge your belief, but it just doesn't really prove for me, this is all a message for accident, we have, we are, I am alone in this universe, and there's, I am a biological accident, and I know, I'm sorry, just so you know, this idea, I'm being honest with you, no that's fine, the, the idea that it's an accident, I think is fallacious. It's totally fallacious. Every physicist today would acknowledge that the universe looks designed. But what they say is, because that some of them, by their premises, cannot accept a designer, they have to speculate a multiverse. A multiverse for which we have no evidence for, except that the mathematics of string theory seem to, like, harmonize with some of our, our, our other theories. Yeah. But the reality is, there's no observation. The reason why they speculate the multiverse is because without the speculation of the multiverse, the universe looks designed. Because evolution doesn't actually, uh, evolution or, or the Big Bang it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't work. No, the, 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 the fine balances of the various forces and mechanisms that we find in the universe or, or don't just happen. Not, not only are they independent forces and independent energies, but they have to be attuned to one another for them to function in such a way that life can emerge. So physicists accept that without the speculation of the multiverse, the universe looks designed. So I'm saying to you that to your observation, to your observation, to an honest observation, the universe looks designed, it doesn't look like an accident. Actually, your belief that you're an accident contradicts the observable evidence. The observable evidence demonstrates design because there are too many independent variables that are so finely tuned along very discrete lines that if any of those variables were off, that the, the whole harmony of the, the symphony would not preserve or create life. But that's the reality you live in. Independent variables working within discrete conditions that harmonize to create life. That, my friend, is design. You're not an accident. There is a greater purpose to your life.
we like, we like to think that there is a purpose because, look, look at it from my point of view. I can, I can understand. You know, in the in the concentration camps during the Second World War, Christians tended to survive more. They had a higher survival rate than non-believers because they were on a mission. They they had a purpose to be a, to be alive. Apparently, Jehovah's Witnesses were really really good at surviving because they had. This was a test that God had actually given them. Yep. Right. And it's the same with Christians as well. Right. That this was a test that God was actually given. Them. So I can actually I can understand why you would actually say no. Yeah, Yes, there is a purpose to that because we want to believe it. But, but unfortunately, the reason why this argument falls down is there's plenty of examples of species that have survived just as well as humans without a sense of purpose. Cheetahs, lions, crocodiles, ants, bees. Ants and bees were around with, uh, with the time of the dinosaurs. They've survived, but they don't. They don't cognitively think of themselves as having a purpose. Yes, and they've not. They've not evolved. Exactly. So the argument from purpose that it is an evolutionary trait that has helped us to survive well it's unnecessary vast majorities of creatures in the creation actually exist without any cognizance of purpose the reason why you have purpose is because you were created in the image of God for his glorification and purpose is imprinted upon your soul you were built with purpose, and actually, that sense of purpose within you again corresponds to the narrative that we Christians have. So reality and narrative are corresponding, which equals truth. And therefore, actually, what you're doing is demonstrating that God is real, that God is there, that your life is not an accident, and that you exist for a reason. Why fight that? Why fight that? Why fight the idea that you might have a purpose when it is intrinsic to your nature? It is intrinsic to my nature. Why I fight it? Why are you fighting it? Why fight it? No, I, because, because in the core of my being, I do, because in the core But the, what I'm saying is, no, what's actually happening is that the core of your being is contradicting your conscious ideology. And your conscious ideology has been formed by a secular, liberal, pluralistic society. And that is what you, that's what you are mistaking for the core of your being. The core of your being is telling you you have a purpose because it's coming up even though you're telling yourself at an intellectual level that you don't. But your nature is saying that you do. It's, you know, we, we have this saying that the, the springs of hope uh, uh, flow eternal. Hope emerges within our human nature. It isn't something that someone gives to us. Your mother doesn't teach you to be hope. You wake up every day hopeful. Isn't that a survival instinct? Though? Isn't that a survival instinct? But we've again demonstrated that there are countless species that survive with any cognizance of hope. Ants survive without hope. Bees survive without hope. Lions survive without hope. The cheetahs survive without hope. You don't need hope to live. The fact that you have hope in your heart is the imprint of the image of God. And it is speaking to you. But you fight it because your society has brainwashed you into thinking something different. And I'm saying that truth should correspond to reality. Your reality is that you have hope and you feel a sense of purpose. Truth should correspond to that. The Bible says you have both. It's got good plans, bro. It's got very good plans. So stop fighting it. Have the courage. If you see the nobility of Christ's teaching, if you see the truth of Christ's teaching, if you see the truth, the, the, the beauty of Christ's ways, then become his disciple. I mean, even if it were not true, take Dante's, um, Dante's, uh, Dante's, Dante's gamble. Pa uh, uh, no, Pascal's, Pascal's, Pascal, Pascal's, Pascal's gamble. gamble. Take Pascal's gamble. If it's not true, then by trying to be a noble and good person in following Jesus' teaching, you might do some good in the world, but you're not going to do any harm. But if it is true and you don't do it, then what awaits you is eternal fire. If it is true, if it isn't true and you do do it, you live a good life and at the end you just pass into dust. So take Pascal's wager. I, but I, I try to live a life, I try to live a good life, right, without taking, not, not out of fear of hellfire, but because it seems to me to be the right, the, the right thing to do. I, I don't do it terribly well, but I do, I try to live a good life 
not because of religious beliefs, not because of a fear that I'm going to be cast into the everlasting fires, but because I want to. I, I want to actually. I don't. Want, I don't want to hurt people, right? But what define what we ascribe value to and the order of our values is particular to Christ's Should it teaching. Go down to, to blackmail? No, it's not blackmail. Christians, we believe that salvation is given to us whilst we're still sinners. It says that in the Bible, that whilst we were yet sinners, God sent his son into the world to die for the world. That's in scripture. Yeah. So whilst you were a sinner, salvation was given to you. So a Christian doesn't do good works because they fear hell. We do good works to adorn the salvation that we're given freely with beauty. It's a way of being human. You should adorn your life with the beauty of goodness and kindness and justice and generosity and patience. So you're not saying, you're, so what you're saying is it's not innate that this is something that's been like a gift from God. Salvation is given freely. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. But once salvation is given to you freely, you can adorn it with beauty. And we do, we do good because we love our God, not because we fear hell. But you're not a Christian, so you should fear hell. Because God, if you don't accept what Christ has done for you, then you will have to answer for your sin. You will have to make an account of the times that you failed to do the good. Not the times you did good, but all the times you failed to be good. And then you will answer for that. Why, look, why yes. has, if, 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 let's say, you know, let's say that your God exists and, you know, why, why has he put me on this earth Great to, to, do this, to do this test? And if I fail, he's going to throw me into the everlasting darkness and just turn his back on me. Why, why would he do that? Isn't that a bit nasty? It's a great question. Isn't and that a, a bit nasty? It's a totally fair question. God created you as a free agent and he placed his image within you because he wants you to be like him as a way of glorifying him on earth in the way that you live. But for you to glorify him through the way that you live as a free agent, your choices must have real consequences. They must have real consequences, otherwise you're not a free agent. You're not making moral decisions. But if you, through mm -hmm. the practice of virtue, through the practice of discipline, through the practice of sacrament, end up reflecting God's image so that you shine like stars in a world fallen in darkness, then you glorify God. And that is your purpose. That is why God put you here. And it is a one-time offer, friend. You don't get to do it again. You get one chance. And God is saying that all the times that you've failed can be taken away by your acceptance of what he does on the cross and then through it, the imitation of his person, you can become like him by the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. But yeah. surely when you when you sort of accepted Christ, yes. you're basically the same person. Yes. You've not really changed. I and sin. you still you still I yeah. still everyone, sin. everyone. I still everyone sin. here. Yep. Yeah. And, so and, how, and how just for the sin? camera because lots of people not little sins. I mean real big sins. Like don't make me into a hero. So so what's changed? I mean look, the thing is is if you've accepted why doesn't why I'm why don't what change does that affect? Well let me yeah, that's a great question. It's a really good question. I can testify to the fact that the way that I am trying to live as a human being has changed. I'll give you an example. I was born in a working class community. English working class community. That had that kind of sort of passive racism, that kind of, you know, general ignorance of the other. And I was raised with that. Yeah, so, was so, I, I, so was I. Yeah. So, so you know what I'm talking about. I, know exactly. I had those views that were racist. Yeah. When I became a Christian, the Christian narrative started to challenge that. Started to challenge it that I repented of it, and now I don't have those attitudes. Here's another example. I was raised to value the army and to value the armed forces of our nation, just like lots of working class families do. And I was going to join the army. I was going to become an officer, go to Sandhurst, and all that. As I, yeah, as I learned the Christian faith, I realized that nationalism and patriotism towards a nation state is incompatible with the Christian faith. And so the very orientation of my career changed. 
So those are two examples of how it changes you. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not struggling with stuff. There are still attitudes in my mind that I haven't fully given over to God. I haven't fully surrendered. I struggle with a fact. How do you square that? How do you square that? If, you, if, you, if you're living and you're, you're falling short, how does that, how does that work if you're falling short? If because, that's exactly why as Christians we believe that we need a saviour. Because it says in the scriptures that all have fallen short of the glory of God. You, me, everybody. And that's why we need a saviour, because to deal with the consequences of that falling short on our own, we haven't got a chance. But God is dealt with that falling short in Christ, so that when we fall short, it is accounted for. So that what we can then do is, is build a life towards goodness. And as we continue to build that life towards goodness, we continue to change. We continue to change our mindsets and our attitudes. So you do sort of slowly transform over yeah, time. You slowly transform over time. What happens? What happens if look you, you get somebody that uh, that accepts Christ and then they they get cancer and they they die very shortly after they accepted Christ. Now they go into they, they died and they're still the, the really sort of base individual that they were. Yep. It's a great question. You're asking really good questions. It's because of people like you that I like to come here. So the, 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 it's a great question. And we have an example of that as the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross was being punished because he sinned. Yes. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did our Lord say? Um, there's something about in, in this day you yeah. shall be with me in paradise. In the kingdom, kingdom, yeah. So one is one is saved by what Christ does for us, not by what we do for ourselves. But if we if we accept Christ and we don't adorn our salvation with good works, yeah, what we end up doing, I'm talking. It's within our sight, within our sight. Yeah. So in terms of in terms of in terms of a, in terms of um, I've lost my track of thought. Oh, yeah. No, it's alright. It's not this track. So in terms of ourselves. If you do not adorn your salvation with any good works, you will still enter into salvation, but you will enter in as one who has passed through fire, so that all that is, is bad about your being is burnt off, as it were. So you will enter into salvation. You, you, will, enter, you will enter into salvation, but you will enter as one like who suffers a loss. And what you will lose is your sin. Because your being is sinful, but you will lose that. I'm sorry, I'm not terribly intelligent, as you probably realise. Think Why about exactly it did you explain that? Yeah, okay, let's use a picture metaphor. It's quite a horrendous one, but let's use it. Let's imagine that your ontology, your being as a human, yeah. is made of gold and silver and wood and straw My base elements, and stone. Yeah. yeah, so the nature of your being is made up of these ingredients. My base elements, yeah. Right. If I put that, that, that being into fire, which bits would be burned away and which bits would survive? Well, probably the metals would probably sort of survive depending on how hot the fire is. Yeah. yeah. It's only hot enough to burn. The wood, the wood, yeah. the carbon. Exactly. So in other words, what I'm saying to you is all your sin will be burnt off. And the base, the base. And that which is that which is remain that is good, that your good works, that those good bits will be carried forward. When does that happen? When does that fire occur? When you pass through the fire, what exactly does that what exactly does that mean? So the church the church the church I mean the church has lots of different views on this. So the Roman Catholic Church has a very clearly defined doctrine around it which they call purgatory. Right. Okay? Now, I, I, I'm not convinced of purgatory. I don't necessarily believe in purgatory. I, other Christians have different ways of conceptualizing and thinking about it that are a bit more hazy. I don't ask how. I just believe that it will occur. I believe that there will be a purification before you enter into the presence of a holy God. But the right to enter into the presence of a holy God is won for you by what Jesus did, not won for you by what you did. Not by good deeds. Not by good deeds. It's given to you freely as a gift, as a pass that Jesus gives you, that you have the right to enter into the presence of God. But if you sorry, sorry, sorry. but if you enter, if you in, if you are trying to walk into the throne room of God as a dirty bugger, one of the courtiers may go to you, not dress like that, you know. No, no, no. Go and get a shower. Bouncer, bouncer. Yeah, yeah. Not like dress like that. You can go get some shoes on. Go and get some clean clothes on. Go and have a shower. So they provide you the facilities, you go and have that shower, you get the new clothes, and then you enter into the presence. I'm, I'm, look, I'm just teasing some things out. But look, suppose you got like Hitler, and at the last he actually worked. Someone like Hitler would, at the last, actually, accept Jesus. How, how is, do 
is he so fallen that he can't? Oh, this is this is the shocking thing about the gospel. Oh yeah. Is he so fallen I, I, that he can't? I, I no. I am telling you, I believe completely that if someone like Hitler genuinely, sincerely accepted Christ and repented of all his evil, he would be in heaven. Especially as my son. So I've got Hitler. Even though he's yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, the thing is, if, if we're all judged according to our works, we're all going to hell. You mean yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, There's no point saying, well, I'm bad, but he's worse. The fact is, if you're bad and he's worse, you're still both going to hell. Yeah? yeah? yeah, yeah. You, he might be genuinely worse than you. But the thing is, if I give you a glass of milk and introduce into that cup a drop of poison that will kill you, whether I'd introduce a drop of poison that will kill you, or a litre of poison that will kill you, the fact is you can't drink the milk. No, no, because it's corrupted. And this is the way that we Christians think about salvation. The, the milk has to be purified, the poison has to be taken out. You must have come across, you must have come across somebody that's like really evil and nasty that's caused you a lot of pain. Yeah, of course so. Right, would you really want to make that? Yes. Really? Yes. Somebody that like, really, really hurt you. Yes. Calls your son. Yes. How many more times do you want me to say yes? Because as Christians, we're called to want the best for our enemies. Is that not noble? Oh God, it is. But I don't know. So why not it pursue is a good thing, yes. that nobility? I'm going to leave you with this. Yeah, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. You are someone who can see the nobility of our faith. Yes, the nobility really of the do, truth yeah. that we teach. I think you're aware of how that truth corresponds to reality. I think it's time that you get off the fence. I think it's time that you let go of what society has taught you and you go with that impulse of the heart, that acknowledgement in the mind of the truth that you see in the Christian faith and you make a commitment to be a disciple of Jesus. I am the only one that Have you got a Bible? Yes, I have. Pick it up and read it. Well, give me something to read. What do I want? I want you to read the Bible. Read the Gospels first. Matthew. Okay. Thank you.